And when does the hold come about on the day of judgment? When does it take place? See, this is the scenario. After the people have been resurrected from their graves, trillions upon trillions, only Allah knows the exact amount. This is from the time of Adam alayhi salam up until the last person to walk the face of this earth. They stand on the plains of the day of judgment, which is going to be an earth, but it's different to the earth that we stand on now. Allah Azza he says, يَوْمَ تُبَدَّلُ الْأَرْضُ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضِ On the day of judgment, Allah Azza He exchanges this earth that we're standing on now to another earth. In the hadith, it says that it is بَيْضَاءُ عَفْرَاءُ نَقِيَّةِ It's like a loaf of bread, a circular loaf of bread, and it's white. There is no hills on it and there's no valleys on it as well. Clear, a plain, flat, smooth surface and a land. People stand on it. And it is going to be really, really crowded to the point when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that there is only space for your two feet to stand. Well, the people are naked on that day. And the sun, as mentioned in the hadith, بِقَدْرِ مِيلٍ مِنْ رُؤُوسِ الْعِبَادِ that it is away from their heads, the distance of a meal. Now a meal, there's two understandings for it. A meal could mean yani one mile, the distance of one mile. And it also, wallahu alam, the second opinion is the more correct, that a meal in the Arabic language, it refers to the, uh, to the length of the eye of the needle. So you have a needle and then you have the eye of the needle where the string goes through. That there, the eye of the needle is called a meal in the Arabic language. So that's a few millimeters. The sun is above the head of the creation a few millimeters. And they're all sweating according to what deeds and yani, they have. Uh, it's hot, it's terrifying, it is horrifying. No one is talking. Allah Azza wa he says, Hal tuhissu minhum min ahad? No one is even moving. Allah Azza wa he asks the question in the Quran, do you even see for any of them any movement? Or tasma'u lahum rikza? Or do you hear any sound from any one of them? Absolute silence. No one dares to speak a single word. In Surah Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, فَلَا تَسْمَعُ لَهُ هم لَهُمْ همسة, That you will not even hear except, يعني He says, فَلَا تَسْمَعُ إِلَّا همسة, You will not hear a single word or a single sound except whispers that they whisper to each other. يَتَخَافَتُونَ بَيْنَهُمْ التَّخَافُتِ يعني Very soft and يعني kind of whispering to each other. That's all you hear. فَيَعْنِ سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ This is the situation. Well, the people are thirsty, extremely thirsty. People are dreaming for just a drop of water to quench their thirst. It is at that moment, before the mizan, before the scales come out, and before the surat, the people walk on the surat to say, oh, this is before all that. Uh, at that moment, al hawb which is a pond, and this is for every single nation alongside with their Prophet, will be presented. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, إِنَّ لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍ حَوْضًا For each and every single Prophet, there's a special hawd. Yani the hawd of Adam alayhi salam is different to the hawd of Nuh alayhi salam. Or the hawd of Ibrahim alayhi salam is different to the hawd of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And every Prophet will be standing at his hawd, and his followers would go to his hawd. So on the hawd of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will not find people from other nations. You will only find people from this ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the continuation of the hadith, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, أَيُّهُمْ أَكْثَرُ وَارِدَةً وَإِنِّي لَأَرْجُوا أَنْ أَكُونَ أَكْثَرُهُمْ وَارِدَةً The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, and indeed the prophets are going to be competing to see which one of them will have the most followers and the most people that would arrive to their hawd. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, and I hope that I am the one with the most people and the most followers. Yeah, in other words, the prophets alayhim salatu was salam, they compete on the day of judgment to see who has the most followers. And the more followers, the more people on the hawd, it makes that prophet more pleased because he has يعني, more followers before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the event of the hawd, it happens before the mizan, before the sirat. Now, where is this hawd? Uh, we'll speak about this hawd and al-kawthar, we're coming to it. But where is this hawd? The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one day, he said, مَا بَيْنَ بَيْتِي وَمِنْ بَرِي رَوْضَةٌ مِنْ رِيَاضِ الْجَنَّةِ وَمِنْ بَرِي عَلَى حَوْضِ He said that between my house and my minbar, between my house and my pulpit, that it is a garden from the gardens of the paradise. When ulama rahimahumullah, when they translated and explained this hadith, they said literally, al you know, al-rawda sharifa in Medina, 
that area is literally a piece of the paradise. What that means is that when the worldly life exists, it ends, when the worldly life ends, that part doesn't get destroyed. It is like the missing piece of the puzzle in the paradise. It'll be lifted from where it is and it'll go and connect back to where it came from, from the paradise. This is what it means. Then the Prophet ﷺ, he says, my mimbar, my pulpit, ala hawdi, it is on my hawd, it is on this pond. Now what does that mean? There are two meanings for this. Number one, it could mean that on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he makes a special mimbar, a special pulpit for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he places it at the top, at the front of the hawd, when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stands on it, and he sees everything that is happening to his nation. And the other meaning is, and some of the ulama said this, that the member that he used to stand on, and he used to deliver his khutab on, it will be brought on the day of judgment, and it will be placed on top of the hawd. And he will stand on it, and he will see his nation and those who come to drink from, uh, from al hawd Wallahu a'lam, yani wa min bari ala hawdi, as he said this to the sahaba, he meant that this member I'm standing on now, that you all see it, it will come and it will be resurrected on the day of judgment. I will stand on it there and it will be placed on my hold and I will see everything. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in the hadith, once when he stood on the mimbar, he said, وَإِنِّي لَأَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ حَوْضِيَ الْآنِ This is before he died sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, and I see my hold right now. فَيَعْنِي This hadith there is a proof that the hawd already is created, it exists, and on the day of judgment, it will be presented before the believers for them to see it and come towards it. Now, what is al kawthar and what is al hawd What is the difference between them? And then what is the relationship between them? My brothers and sisters in Islam, there are many ahadith, authentic ahadith, that describe the kawthar exactly like the hawd so that they're exactly the same in their description. The ahadith would say, ashaddu bayadan min al-asal that the water that is in al kawthar is wider than milk. And the water in the hawd is also wider than milk. And it's sweeter than honey. And its fragrance is sweeter than musk. These are hadith sahih. Now when it comes specifically to al kawthar and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he described it by saying, al kawthar nahrun fil jannati haffatahu min dhahab. He said that al kawthar is a river in the paradise in which its banks are made of gold. Yani on other side it is made of gold. And in another hadith, he says that on either sides, there are tents made from hollow pearls. Yani like a huge sized pearl, and it is hollow from inside, and people live inside, they reside in those pearls. And then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Majrahu ala durri wal yaqut. That the water of this kawthar, it flows over pearls and precious stones, like the ruby and the sapphire and so on, that is underneath it. And then he said, Turbatuhu atyabu min al misk that the dirt, the soil that is underneath is more pure than musk and, it, it's, and its water is sweeter than honey and its water is also wider than, than milk. This is the description of Al-Kawthar. Well, Hawd, this is what Al-Hawd is. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says about the Hawd, he says, uh, he says that it is sourced from Al-Kawthar. Sourced from Al-Kawthar. And he says, يَمُدَّانِهِ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ أَحَدُهُمَا مِنْ ذَهَبٍ وَالْآخَرُ مِنْ وَرِقٍ يعني This is what it is. al hawd is going to be on the plains of the Day of Judgment, on the earth. Well, Kawthar is a river in the paradise. And there is a pipe that is streaming from al Kawthar down into al hawd There are two pipes. One is made of gold and the other is made of silver. And so the water from al Kawthar it streams down these pipes and it fills the hawd on the Day of Judgment. And so this is how al hawd wal kawthar are يعني, the same because it is channeled and it is fed, يعني, it's sourced. al hawd al hawd is sourced by al kawthar as mentioned in the authentic hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For this is what we understand. al hawd is that which happens on the day of judgment, on the plain, on the earth. Well, kawthar is that which is up in the heavens and it's sourced. That's how we understand the difference between al hawd wal kawthar. The size of al hawd now. There are hadith that mention to us the size of al hawd and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Inna hawdi ma bayna al-ka'bati wa bayt al-maqdis. And in another narration, he says, Hawdi masiratu shahrin wa zawayahu sawa. Two authentic narrations. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, that my hawd, the distance of it, is like between the Kaaba and Jerusalem, bayt al-maqdis. 
in the other hadith he says Masira to Shahr. In other words, the length of the hold is the distance of one month for the rider on a fast horse. It'll take one month to go from one side of it to the other side. And then Nabi Sallallahu he said, Wazawayahu sawa, meaning its lengths are all the same. What does that make the hold? It makes the hold in a square shape. Zawayahu sawa, meaning the hold is a square. And so going from one corner to the other is one month. And going from one corner to the other is another month. And from one corner to the other, and the four corners and the four edges are all the same in length. Wallahu alam. Huge. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, it is full of cups and it's full of jugs equal to the number of stars that you see on a dark night. And it, you go out to the desert, not here. And here now you cannot see. You probably can only see two, three stars because of the light pollution and so on. I mean, if you go to the desert, really far from here, where there is absolute no pollution and no light to irritate or to disturb your vision of the sky, you would see, subhanallah, you would see millions and millions and millions of stars all clustered right next to each other. Here the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, عَدَدُ آنِيَتِهِ كَنُجُومِ السَّمَاءِ And then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that a day will come in which everyone will be drinking from it. It will be that crowded and that busy. Subhanallah. What it also means when the Nabi Sallallahu says that its cups are equal to the number of stars, some of the ulama, rahimahumullah, they interpreted this to mean that the hold itself, it twinkles like the stars during the night twinkle, right? So يعني, it was mentioned as a reference of, of, uh, يعني, uh, 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 of how bright it is and how beautiful it is. It just twinkles, right? Subhanallah. So the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, but of course, the more correct opinion is to say that there are many cups for it so that the believers drink from it. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Man abada. Anyone who came by and drank from it will never ever experience thirst ever again in his life. What does that mean? Meaning when this person eventually enters the paradise and when he drinks from the rivers of the paradise, he doesn't drink to quench his thirst. Drinking in the paradise would now become purely a matter of pleasure and enjoyment, and that's it. Not out of thirst. For what is mentioned meant by Lam Yavma Ba'daha Abada. And there's something here very important to, to highlight on, and that there is no narration, even though this is famous among the people, but there is no narration that was reported that the people drink from the blessed hand of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And from that we understand that it is wrong when one makes a dua to say and uh, provide for us a drink from the blessed hands of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You hear this dua sometimes in Taraweeh wal Imam they make isqina min yadihi sharifa sharbatan la nazma'u ba'daha abada. There is nothing in the ahadith or authentic narrations to even suggest that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would give the people to drink from his hand. Well, ulama rahimahumullah they said that the cups are in the pond for a reason and that is so that the people drink from it. And then it is not befitting for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to give each and every single person uh, a drink from his hand, uh, as al ulama rahimahumullah mentioned. For they, they, uh, they actually, uh, they considered making that kind of dua, at-ta'addi fi dua crossing the limits in dua. Rather, one, when he makes a dua, he should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant him permission and the ability to drink from the hawd without mentioning from the yad of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and so on. And unless there is a narration which al-ulama rahimahumullah mentioned that there is no narration in that. Fa wallahu a'lam. Wa hadha dua. Yani how many of us make this dua? There was, yani, they, they mentioned that yani, there was a lady that each and every single salat, her children would hear her make this dua Allahumma sqina min hawdi nabiyika sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sharbatan la nazma'u ba'daha abada. Fanta, yani, is this dua a part of your life? Al hawd huwa, yani, subhanallah, the first, it is the first place where you would actually meet face to face in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It will be at the hawd. Fanta, when you ask Allah azza wa jal to grant you a drink from al hawd, meaning you ask Allah azza wa jal to also give you that, yani, that contact and that face to face connection with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, al hawd, uh, who will drink from it first? There are hadith that mention this as well. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, basically in the hadith, he says that the most pious would drink from it first. But that is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Umar radiallahu anhu, Uthman, Ali, 
uh, and then from there al muhajirin رضي الله عنهم they will be the first to drink from it then after that there is a hadith that mentions that the people of Yemen and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he says that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would be pushing away crowds of people from al hawb he pushes away crowds of people and he makes way for the people of Yemen to come closer and he strikes his staff on the hawb until eventually it gushes and it bursts in their face and it drenches them with the water from it. This is a specialty that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave for the people of Yemen. Why, why are the people of the Yemen يعني, the first يعني, to drink from it after al-Sahaba or after al-Muhajireen? Because the people of Yemen, who, who are they? يعني, and who's the other group? Al-Ansar. Al-Ansar originally are people from Yemen. Al-Aws and Khazraj, these two tribes make up Al-Ansar. When Ansar end up in Medina, how did they end up in Medina? Yani what happened in Yemen, there was a, uh, yani the dam, the dam burst and there was a huge flood that happened. Allah Azza wa recalls and mentions this story in the Quran. فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ سَيْلَ الْعَرِمِ Right? Uh, that's uh, يعني سَدُّ مَأْرَبْ or سَدُّ مِئْرَبْ It's mentioned in the hadith and in the, in the history, in the tariq. فَإِنْ إِكْسْبْلُودِ It burst and it filled the entire land with water. You couldn't live there anymore. فَالْأَوْسْ وَالْخَزْرَجْ Two tribes that lived in Yemen picked themselves up and they took off until they reached to al Madina. Once they reached to al Madina, they settled there. يعني this is why they are considered the Ansar. And this is why the Al-Ansar, meaning they're the ones that supported and aided and helped Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They're the ones that provided for him a room and a house and a space for him to come uh, and an opportunity to, to build his da'wah in, in al Madina. For because of this and, and, and يعني, the people of Yemen, they entered Islam without any war, without any battle, and they aided and supported the Islam more than anyone else. So they had this speciality that they were يعني, put forth on the hold before anyone else, and they came after يعني, Al-Muhajireen. Wallahu a'lam. Uh, this is uh, يعني, in regards to those who first drink from it. And then the more pious and pious after that, until the one least with Iman is the last one to drink from Hawd and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the final question that we answer on this, and that is, who will be turned away from the Hawd of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Well, here, here, there's something very important to mention. Number one, those who left Islam after the death of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the companions, al murtaddin there are companions that left Islam after the death of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They're the ones that refused to pay zakat. Or Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu fought them and he killed from them some. And some of them lived and some of them made tawbah and came back. These are the first that is mentioned by those that will be turned away from al hawq Number two, the hypocrites. And they are people that lived in Medina at the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they witnessed Islam, but internally they hid their kufr and their disbelief and they again would be resurrected on the day of judgment and they're warded and they're turned away from al hawq And number three, those who innovated in the religion, whether they innovated in the matters of belief, in aqidah matters, or whether they innovated in matters of worship, fil ibadah, whether in this or in that, these are considered on the day of judgment, innovators, suhqan liman baddala ba'di, and they are removed from the hawd and they're turned away from the hawd of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Oh, this is why, يعني, my brothers and sisters in Islam, we should be careful, يعني, when we say that we're Muslims and we follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, being steadfast upon the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just about praying and fasting and salat and zakat. It's not just about that. Being steadfast upon the deen of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam involves three things. Being steadfast in matters of aqidah. So that you do not alter and you do not change anything of that and you understand and you take your aqidah from the Quran and Sunnah and uh, يعني, from the explanation of the Salaf, which is the first three generations that came after Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number one, that's, that, that means we're steadfast in the deen. Number two, in matters of worship as well. So you remain consistent and committed on your salat, one Ramadan in fasting, with zakat, with hajj if you're able to, and, uh, يعني, and, and the rest of the good deeds that we're taught to do. And number three, steadfast upon al-akhlaq which is character and morals and manners that the Muslim is supposed to have. And why do we mention this? Al-istiqamah, steadfastness must be in these three things. And I'll prove to you how this is. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and listen, this is the very important point that would actually prove يعني, what was mentioned by ulama rahimahumullah. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa described al-khawarij, who are al-khawarij? Al-khawarij are a sect that innovated in their belief 
When the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described the Khawarij to the Sahaba, not to me and you, when he described them to the Sahaba, he said to the Sahaba, تحتقرون صلاتكم إلى صلاتهم وصيامهم إلى صيامكم. He said to the Sahaba رضي الله عنهم that you people would belittle your salat in comparison to the salat of the Khawarij. And you would belittle your fasting in comparison to the fasting of Al Khawarij. فيعني سبحان الله النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم is saying so. يعني when you when you compare the Sahabi to a Khawarij person, then the this person of Al Khawarij he prays a lot more than the Sahabi, and he fasts much more than the Sahabi, and he reads Quran much more than the Sahabi. So this guy has got it good in his worship. Except that when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam described them, he said, "Hum kilabu ahlil nar," that they're the dogs of the hellfire. Why? And this teaches you that it wasn't only a matter of remaining steadfast on your worship. Your aqidah and your belief should have been steadfast and right as well, and your character should have been steadfast and right as well. For even this hadith is very important, and it teaches us that al Khawarij still ended up in Jahannam because the issue isn't just doing righteous actions. It was about a methodology that you were supposed to adopt and a sunnah that you were supposed to follow word for word.